All right, so uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan, and I'll be talking today about some of the work I did last year at Amherst College as part of my th senior thesis on spatial cross-validation. Um, so this work was done with my advisor, Albert Kim. Uh, so many thanks for him uh, for his support and insight. So we're gonna start um, just with a quick refresher on model assessment and cross-validation. So this is a tree and I hope we're all familiar with those. Um, so individual trees are the observations we'll be working with today. Um, we'll have two predictor variables per tree, species and size, and one response, which is growth. Um, and just as a reminder, we'll generally think about responses as some combination of signal and noise, right? So we assume that somewhere out there in nature, there's a relationship F between tree species, size, and growth. And all trees follow this relationship with some random noise epsilon on top, which maybe comes from weather or animals or whatever. And so now we fit a model, F hat, right? And the goal of this model is that it'll be able to take in tree observations X and output growth predictions Y hat. Um, and in this presentation, we'll be considering supervised learning models in general. So think linear regression or neural nets or whatever, your favorite supervised learner. Um, so now maybe we fit a uh, linear regression to some training data. And so a reasonable question to ask at this point is how good is our model, right? And to be a bit more specific, we're interested in it's out of sample error. So in other words, if we grabbed a random tree um, from the population, likely not from our training set, and this tree has some properties X naught, how close should we expect our model's growth prediction, Y hat naught, to be to the tree's actual growth, Y naught, on average, right? So one naive way um, that we might want to assess our model is to compute its error on its training set, right? So the problem that we know, right, is that training error will almost always underestimate out of sample error. Um, and we're gonna go into a bit of detail here, uh, just to be clear. So the growth of our the points in our training set T are assumed to be generated by both the signal F and some noise specific to T, right? We'll call that epsilon T. Um, and our model is optimized based only on what it sees, which is YT. So we want our model to learn F, um, which is the true relationship between species, size, and growth. But we don't want it to memorize epsilon T because out of sample trees probably won't have the same epsilons as similar trees in our training set. The issue is that training error just awards good predictions of yt, which means that the models that do memorize the noise epsilon t will tend to have the lowest training errors, right? So in general, training error is too optimistic of an estimate of out-of-sample error, um, which is just to say that it underestimates out-of-sample error. So instead, we can use a validation set, which is an independently collected set of data from the same population. Um, we still fit a model on our training set, but now we evaluate it on our validation set. And this works because validation set points are still generated by the same F that we trained our data on, uh, trained our model on, but they have a different set of errors, epsilon B, right? So this means that the models that memorize epsilon T will now perform poorly, while models that actually learned F will do well and hope. So an important assumption here um, is that the validation set is independent from the training set. The signal F should be the same, but the noise should be completely independent. And this will be important in a little bit. So validation sets are good, um, but their drawback is that data used for validating is not used for training, which hurts our error estimates because models typically perform better when trained on more data. So to get around this issue, we can do things like cross-validation. Um, and these days, cross-validation is practically synonymous with k-fold cross-validation. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'll just do a quick run through five-fold cross-validation. So we first randomly divide the data into five folds. Our training set here has 25 trees, so each fold will have five trees. So let's just look at the trees in fold one, which are in black. So for fold one, we'll treat the black trees as a validation set. So we'll train our model on the 20 green trees, record its error on the five black trees, and then we'll do this whole process five times, once for each fold, and then use the average error as our error estimate. So basically the idea is that for each fold, the training and validation sets include different observations, so hopefully we think they're independent, right? And this is more or less true in many settings where observations are IID, for example, um, but we'll see shortly that it's very not true in most spatial settings. 
Okay, so that was a bunch of background to get us to what I think is the interesting part of this talk, so thanks for sticking around. Um, so now we'll talk about model assessment with spatial data. And at the end of the day, it really all boils down to this quote, um, which is often attributed to geographer Waldo Tobler. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Okay, well, duh, right? Um, but this simple idea has big implications for cross-validation. And basically, in particular, if we look at our data set, right, Tobler's law is going to have a significant impact on our error term here, this epsilon, which accounts for all factors that affect tree growth besides species and size. So for example, maybe our forest here um, has a river and maybe trees closer to rivers grow more. I'm not sure I'm not an ecologist, but let's just go with that assumption. So these trees here, you'll see in the blue numbers, um, they have a bit of extra growth, right? Due to an unmodeled variable distance from river. And just to build on this example, um, maybe oak trees have a harder time growing when they're higher up. So uh, these oaks grow less. So these are just toy examples. Um, but the important takeaway is that in general with spatial data, we very much expect our epsilon terms to be clustered in space, sort of like these ones, right? Because factors that affect one tree will very likely affect all nearby trees as well, because that's just how things work in the real world. So this turns out to be a problem for cross-validation. Um, so say we've partitioned a training and test set like this for five-fold cross-validation, and let's highlight the area um, around our validation set trees. So for cross-validation to work well, we want the black trees to be independent from the green ones, right? And if you recall, we want to be particularly sure that memorizing the epsilons for the green trees doesn't help our predictions on the black trees. The problem is that these trees in red are located close to the black trees. So because this is spatial data, knowing information about the green trees in our training set tells us about the errors associated with the black trees. Right, so this means that traditional k-fold cross-validation will be too optimistic for spatial data. It'll run into the same issues as using training error. So how do we solve this problem? Um, one approach is to use blocking. So the idea here is quite simple. Um, just when we resample our data to get our validation sets, we should randomly resample blocks of land instead of individual observations. Um, this guarantees that no training set observations will be interspersed with our validation set. Um, to improve on this, we can add buffering as well. And with buffering, we just remove all of the training set observations that are close to our validation set. So if we assume that most spatial autocorrelation is relatively short distance, which is a reasonable assumption in most cases, having buffers increases the independence between our training and validation sets. Okay, so now that we have blocking and buffering, let's look at some assessment methods that incorporate these ideas. So the first of the methods that we're going to look at is buffered grid cross-validation. So first we lay down a grid on our spatial data. Um, we can control the size of this grid like how we control K and K-fold cross-validation. Then for each cell, uh, we pick the cell. Uh, here we start with the upper left cell, and then we use adjacent cells as buffer regions. Right? So finally, a single fold of buffered cro grid cross-validation might look like this. Right? We train on the training set validate on the validation set and repeat for each cell and average the results, much like k-fold cross-validation. Uh, the second spatial cross-validation method we'll look at is more similar to leave one out cross-validation, which is just k-fold when each observation gets its own fold. So in spatial leave one out, um, we still let each tree be its own fold, uh, but we also incorporate a buffer region around each tree, right? So each fold ends up looking like this. Um, and again, we'd average the results for all of the 25 trees in our data set in this case. So here's just a little table um, summarizing the cross-validation methods we've seen. And up to this point in the talk, we've only looked at model assessment, uh, which is the problem where given a model, we want to estimate how well it would perform on out-of-sample data. But oftentimes, we're also interested in the problem of model selection. And model selection just asks which model is best, right? So if we're given two candidate models, um, F and G, say, uh, there might be two linear regressions with different predictors, um, which model would we expect to perform better on out-of-sample data? 
So there are a ton of methods for this problem. Um, but in this presentation, we're going to approach it using methods for model assessment that we just went over, cross-validation. So given f and g, we'll first estimate each of their out-of-sample errors using their model assessment methods. Um, and then we'll just select the model um, with the least estimated error. Super simple. So in reality, there's a bit more to think about. But in the interest of time here, I'm glossing over considerations of the bias variance trade-off and cross-validation. Um, so if you're interested in that, my paper spends a bunch of time discussing it, or you can feel free to ask about it after this talk. OK, so finally, we've made it to the simulation study. Um, and so far, we've looked at four cross-validation methods, k-fold, leave one out, buffered grid, and spatial leave one out. And we know how to use them to perform model selection. For this part of the presentation, I'll show some of the results from two simulations, one to compare the cross-validation methods for model assessment on spatial data, and another to compare them for model selection on spatial data. So for both simula si simulations, I make 100 simulated data sets with 500 observations each. For each data set, I first uniformly scatter the 500 observations onto a 100 by 100 grid, and then I randomly generate spatially correlated variables, x1, x2, and x3, by converting the pairwise distance matrix into a covariance matrix for a multivariate normal. And then finally, I compute the response here, growth, as sort of an arbitrary messy function of the spatially correlated variables x1, x2, and x3, and then add some random noise epsilon, uh, which includes both spatially autocorrelated and non-spatial noise. So uh, just to be clear, here's an example of the growth values of one simulated data set. We see that the points closer to each other tend to have similar growth values, uh, which shows the end result of all of the spatial autocorrelation that goes into the predictors and the noise. So for our assessment simulation, uh, we do this for each of the 100 simulated data sets. So first, we compute the four cross-validation error estimates. Then we compute the true error for the model um, on the data set by fitting the model to the data set and then averaging its error over all 99 other data sets. And then finally, we look at the differences between the error estimates and the true error. OK, so this is a table with the average results from our assessment simulation. Um, we're including training error as a baseline reference. And as expected, it's the most over-optimistic. Um, we note that all of our cross-validation methods actually turn out to be too optimistic, since they underestimate true error uh, over here on average. So we see our spatial methods seem to be less over-optimistic than the non-spatial ones, at least on average. Um, but since we have 100 data sets, we can actually look at these values distributions. So this chart looks a little messy, um, but it just plots the density over the 100 data sets of the cross-validation estimates, um, which are over here um, on the right, minus the true error for the data set. So zero difference is good, right? denoted by the vertical black line. We see that the non-spatial methods in black peak to the left of zero, which just visually confirms that they underestimate true error on average. Right? The spatial methods in red, though, peak closer to zero. Right? They're still a little optimistically biased, but their center is close to zero. And so while they have some heavy tail behavior, they're clearly less biased than the non-spatial methods. Um, so our assessment method, our simulation, confirms our intuitions um, about how we think spatial versus non-spatial methods might perform on spatial data. So next, we move on to the model selection simulation. Um, we use the same simulation data sets as before, but now we generate growth as a function only of x1 and x2. So this is our true model. And we do this because we want to consider four linear regression models. Uh, M1 and M2 are underspecified, which means they include fewer variables in the true model. M3 is a true model, and M4 is overspecified. So now to run the simulation for all 100 data sets, we compute the four cross-validation error estimates for each of the four models. So basically, each cross-validation method can select the model it estimates to have the least error on the data set. And it does this for each of the 100 data sets. So these are some of the results from the simulation. Um, so we notice we want to select model three, since that's the actual true model. Um, and as expected, we see that training error just sort of as a baseline. It'll always select the overspecified model. Importantly, though, we see that our spatial assessment methods select model three much more frequently than their non-spatial analogs, which tend to select the overspecified model. 
Um, this also matches our theoretical ideas, right? Because the spatial, the non-spatial assessment methods don't block or buffer. Uh, so they reward models that can overfit to the spatial data, uh, spatial noise in the data, which means that non-spatial methods will be more likely to select the most flexible model, which is model four. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, while results are still quite preliminary, both our intuitions and our simulations for spatial cross-validation show that it improves assessment and selection for spatial data. So obviously there's a lot more that can be done in this area and a bunch of stuff that got glossed over in this talk, but I hope you learned something and thank you very much for your time. Um, these are just some references and I guess now we're open for questions. Um, thanks again. Great, thank you, Jonathan, for that talk. The first question is from Brad Thiessen. Um, it is, what process or rules of thumb are used to choose the size of the buffer? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, thanks for that. Um, in general, the sizes of the buffers are pretty uh, case by case based on kind of domain knowledge. Um, perhaps, you know, the, the scientific problem you're working with, like maybe trees, we don't expect spatial autocorrelation to go beyond, you know, 10 yards or something, 30 yards. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty ad hoc um, and sort of varies just based on scientific knowledge. Thanks. Great, another question. Um, what class best prepared you for this project? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I think we had sort of a intro to machine learning type course. Um, I think that best prepared me for this project, mostly because uh, it showed me sort of how much we kind of depend on cross-validation without really thinking about um, what's going on behind the scenes, like what we're assuming when we're you know, cross-validating our model and just getting an error estimate. Great. Um, another question is, uh, where do you see your work being applied in the future or future projects of yours or of other people? Great question. Um, I guess my work in particular was more um, just sort of surveying and looking at uh, these methods. So um, I'm not sure about particular applications of this, at least um, my advisor has a project that he's going to uh, incorporate some of this into. But I feel like in general, um, there's a lot of room for thinking about cross-validation a bit more carefully, um, particularly in settings uh, where there's a lot of dependency between observations. Great. And we have one more question. Um, which aspects of this work are most exciting to you? Hmm. Most exciting, let's see. Um, I think just the, the idea of being able to work a bit more with um, data that, that we don't just sort of out of the box assume is independent. Um, because nowadays, I guess we have so much more computational power than we used to. Um, so it sort of opens up a lot of avenues for, for uh, breaking that IED sort of assumption and uh, thinking more carefully about dependencies. Thanks. Great, I think that's all the time we have um, until the next presentation. So thank you again for presenting on spatial cross-validation.